Good morning, afternoon, or evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's very good of you to join us for this webcast on muscle recruitment algorithms. Uh, we are going to begin with a short review of the program for today, and uh, I will initially uh, first talk about the basics of muscle recruitment, and then I'll speak about how these basics are implemented into the anybody modeling system, and we'll end with some conclusions and a question and answer session. Uh, just a few words about who is your who is uh, your um, uh, your host and, and presenter today. Um, your host is uh, the spacey guy in the middle with the tie. This is Casper Gana Nicholson, and he is uh, the host and he is representing Anybody Technology. And um, Anybody Technology is hosting and sponsoring the event. My name is John Rasmussen, and I'm the guy over on the left hand side with the glasses. And I come from Marble University, the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And I'm the guy who will be giving the presentation. And then we have on the right-hand side my colleague, Sam Cherholm. And he is the panelist today. And his job is to answer any questions that you may have uh, during the presentation. And concerning questions, we have a question and answers panel. Uh, and in the webcast system, you can access this question and answers panel. Uh, somewhere on your screen, you should see a panel that looks like the one that I am highlighting up here. And in that question and answers panel, you find a little question mark. If you click the question mark, the question and answers panel will appear. And into that panel, you can type any question you want at any time during the presentation. So whenever a question pops up in your head, please don't hesitate to ask the question. Now, before you submit the question, um, please select the destination of the question as host, presenter, and panelists, as I have shown down here. And this will ensure that rather than just going to Casper, uh, the question will also reach CERN. And if the question is an easy one, then CERN is going to answer it right away. If the question is one that seems to have be, be interesting for the, the rest of the audience, then he's going to uh, stack it away and give it to me at the end of the presentation. And then, then I will present it orally here in the webcast. So if you don't get an answer right away, it's, uh, please don't worry about that. It's because you've been selected as a particularly important person. Um, so let's continue immediately with the basics of muscle recruitment. And, um, and I would like to say that there are various ways that you can figure out what the muscle forces are in the human body. And uh, the way that we do it is based on a technology called inverse dynamics. But it might not be exactly the inverse dynamics that you're thinking about when somebody says inverse dynamics. Because there is an old school type of inverse dynamics that comes from the field of motion analysis. And uh, this is the type of, uh, of inverse dynamics that um, requires an open chain system uh, for which you have recorded the, the reaction forces between the body and the environment, typically by having a person step on a force platform. Now, if you have open chains, and if you know the end forces, then it's a very, very simple matter to set up the equations that will calculate the joint forces all the way through the system. Uh, this is simply a series of, of one couple of simple equations that you have to solve. And so this has been possible for many years, and it's actually not something that you really need a fancy modeling system to do. Um, so you can compute the net joint moments, but you cannot compute the net joint forces. And um, surprisingly often, people are mistaken about this. Uh, they think that with this old school type of inverse dynamics, you're, you're actually capable to assess what the joint forces are, and this is totally wrong. And I'll get back to that in just a moment. Um, also, this old school inverse dynamics very often uh, disregards gravity and inertia forces, so it basically presumes that it's a quasi static situation that you're working with. So um, perhaps by now you have guessed that my idea is that old school inverse dynamics is not actually very useful. Um, the reason why this is not so useful is that most of the situations that we want to compute in musculoskeletal modeling are actually not open chain situations. And you see a couple of those on the pictures on the right hand side here. Um, on the top picture you can see a guy holding onto a hand wheel. And obviously the guy is holding on the hand wheel with both his hands and the hands are connected through the hand wheel. So what one arm is doing is affecting what happens in the other arm. He could actually relax completely in one arm and then just drive the hand wheel uh, with the other arm. Um, so the two arms here are affecting each other and in this case it is not possible to solve uh, the equations just by, uh, or uh, find out what the joint torques are just by, by solving simple equations as we did before. Another example you see below, this is a case of egress from an automobile. 
And uh, you can see in this case that the, the subject has both one feet on the one foot on the ground and one foot in the foot in the car, and uh, one hand is holding onto the window frame, and the other hand incidentally is resting on the thigh. So in this case, also the the, uh, uh, the mechanism forms several closed loops, and these closed loops cannot be solved by old school inverse dynamics. Um, another complication is that you can see that the the, the, the models actually have muscles. And um, and muscles are the reasons why you cannot calculate joint reactions properly by old school inverse dynamics. And the reason is that the external forces uh, create moments about the joints, and these moments have to be balanced by the muscles. And the muscles usually have much smaller moment arms than the external forces have. This means that the muscles must pull uh, relatively more on the bones than the external forces do in order to, to obtain equilibrium. And so the contribution from the muscles to the joint reactions are very, very significant. So if you don't have the muscle forces, you're simply going to be very, very wrong about the size of the joint reaction forces in the system. You're going to grossly underestimate what the joint forces are. Um, so it's necessary to do something else, and, uh, and this is exactly what we're trying to do in anybody. So in this case, you cannot solve the equations just by simple. Uh, equation solving and you have to do something else. We need algorithms that can handle close chains and muscles and also dynamics because very often you cannot neglect the dynamics the inertia forces actually play an important role in many models. So the good news is that um, two of these complications or two of these uh, things that we want to add to the models are actually creating the same type of complication. The redundancy in terms of uh, the muscle forces and the statical indeterminacy in terms of uh, the close change, um, those are creating the same type of complication. And uh, this redundancy can be solved by means of an optimization algorithm. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I want to first introduce a simple equation. The simple equation is the one that you see here on the left-hand side, and I'm going to circle it now. This is a simple matrix equation. C is a coefficient matrix. F is a vector of internal forces, and that would be muscle forces and joint forces in the system. And D is a vector of external forces. So these are the applied external forces. Uh, that might be ground reaction forces, if you know what they are. That might be gravity, or it might be uh, inertia forces from the, the accelerations of uh, the different elements that are in the model. Now, my point is that when you try to set up a system of equations for a redundant system like this, then you end up having more equations in the F, sorry, more unknowns in the F vector than you have equations in the system. And so when you have a, a system of equations where you have more unknowns than you have equations, and it's a linear system, it usually means that you have infinitely many solutions to the system of equations. There is one additional uh, constraint that we have to take care of, and that's the one that we have written down here. And that's the constraint that muscles can only pull, they cannot push. Um, and actually, this is also the case for some of the joints. They can only push and they cannot pull. So some of the unknowns in our unknown F vector are restricted in sign. And we have just, for simplicity, we've just said that these are the ones that are uh, designated by M, uh, M for muscle. And they must all be larger than zero. Um, so you can see now that we have divided the F vector up into two uh, parts. One part is R for joint reactions. These are in principle free in sign. And then the other part is for muscle forces, and these are restricted in sign. Um, also, you can see the matrix C is rectangular, so there are infinitely many solutions to the system of equations, and now we need to come up with a way of picking the right one. And doing that is, uh, is where we apply the optimality. So optimization is actually the way that you can uh, select one solution out of many possible solutions. You can Basically, you can select the best solution in some sense. So here we are presuming that evolution and learning through our lives will enable us to control our muscles in such a way that we somehow maximize or optimize the effort that uh, we have to um, exert in order to solve a given motion task. Um, so we have to come up with some objective function T which is expressing the intention of the body as it is doing the motion. And obviously, different choices of T, of T will give us different muscle recruitment patterns. But one of the points that I will get to in a moment is that the, uh, those muscle recruitment patterns are actually not that 
uh, difference. Okay, so, so let's look at possible choices for the objective function. For simplicity, I'm initially going to restrict myself to polynomial forms. So I'm going to presume that um, my G function has the form that you see here. It is simply a sum of uh, normalized muscle forces. Actually, there should be an M here. I forgot to write that. Sorry about that. There should be an M right there. So these are just in principle the muscle forces. So we are normalizing all those muscle forces by some normalization factor, which we call Ni. And these normalized muscle forces we raise to a power of P. And then we sum them all up, and we say this is our objective function. Obviously, now different objective functions are characterized by different choices of the normalization factor n and the power p. And uh, we can look at some obvious choices of p. If we set p equal to 1, and we, tr and we, we try it out and see what, what kind of result we're getting, then we will quickly find that p equal to 1 is not a good choice, because it fails to produce the muscle synergism that we see um, between the muscles when we do experiments. So if we do an experiment and we measure the muscle activation over several ma muscles spanning the same joint in the same direction, then we always see that the muscles are helping each other. So, uh, um, so selecting P equal to 1 will fail to produce muscle synergism. So that is not a correct choice. We can also set P larger than 1. So any value larger than 1 will actually cause muscle synergism. And the larger P is, the more muscle synergism we're getting. Um, I'll get back to you in a moment, actually, that, um, that setting p larger than 1 um, will, uh, for all possible choices of p that are less than infinity, it will um, require additional constraints on the problem when we increase the load towards the maximum that the, that the organism can, can carry. Otherwise, we end up with some of the muscles being overloaded and other muscles being uh, loaded below maximum, and this obviously does not seem like a good idea. Uh, we don't want to overload any muscles if, the, if there's a way that the organism can carry the load without this overloading of any muscles. Now, we can think of P as being getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and in principle going to infinity. When P goes to infinity, we get into a situation of maximum muscle synergism. It means that the muscles are helping each other as much as possible. And, uh, and that is the special case that I'll get back to and talk about in detail a little later. Um, for now, I think it's, it, it's worth just mentioning that all criteria larger than, for, with P larger than 1, will predict synergism in the system. I also want to say a few words about the, the, the significance of the N, the normalization factor here. There's no doubt that you need a normalization factor, because if you haven't got that, then you end up with a situation where the large muscles are not carrying more than the small muscles. So N somehow has to reflect uh, the strength of the muscles. And uh, many authors in the scientific literature have guessed that N would be the, cross, the physiological cross-sectional area of the muscles, so that what we have here in the quotient in, under the summation sign is actually a muscle stress. Um, and that actually produces quite reasonable results, as we shall see in a moment. However, we can also do more advanced things with the N. We can let the N be a function of the, of the present muscle state. So N becomes a function of the muscle contraction um, and the muscle contraction velocity. And uh, in that case, we have contraction dynamics built into the model. And N becomes a whole model type of, um, of muscle description. And uh, I may get back to that also a little later. Um, I don't want to go too much into the mathematics here, because a webcast is really not a, go, a, a good uh, forum to, to, to uh, convey that kind of information. If any of you want to know more about this, uh, there is a, a paper in the Journal of Biomechanics that you can consult, uh, which is this one, Muscle Recruitment by the MinMax Criterion. And uh, that has a lot of those uh, considerations and the math behind them that I'm discussing here. I also want to direct your attention to another paper by Perutsky and Gregor in the IEEE transactions on rehabilitation engineering from September 2000. Uh, what they did was they took a, a, a bicycle model and they created a musculoskeletal model of that. And uh, then they ran the model with various choices of objective functions. And uh, then they compared with uh, measured data from, an ex from a similar experiment. And then they uh, calculated a norm for the difference between the experiment and the predictions by the model. 
and so they could say something about which criterion would be the best one. And you can see that the good criteria here are the ones that will give you a low, a low value of, of the uh, error percentage. And uh, you can see that the ones that will give you that are the ones with the square markers, and those are the ones where they have been normalizing the muscle forces by the PCSA of each muscle. And then they have raised it to a power of n. And the power of n you can see here on the x-axis, uh, the abscess axis of the, of the graph. And you can see they've tried 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and going up to infinity. And the interesting thing here is that all of the values above 1, 1 is actually not a good solution. 1 is, is that solution that you see here. It doesn't seem to be a good solution. But any other solution one, uh, above 1 seems to be a good choice. Um, and they are actually not very different in the, in the size of the error that you're getting. And this is going to be one of my points going forward. Um, I also said initially that there are actually different ways of handling musculoskeletal modeling. Um, we are doing it by a, an, an adaptive or modernized version of inverse dynamics. But you can also find a lot of authors that have very successfully uh, done forward dynamics simulations of musculoskeletal systems, even rather complicated ones. And, um, and the, the advantage of forward dynamics is that it allows you to take some of the um, more complicated properties of muscles into account, namely the uh, activation dynamics of muscles. This is kind of difficult to do in inverse dynamics, but it, it also kind of naturally comes into forward dynamics. So doing this by forward dynamics, you can get a solution, and you can also get a, a similar solution using an inverse dynamics model. And that's what uh, Frank Anderson and Marcus Pandit tried uh, in the paper that you see here. And they came to the conclusion that the two methods actually uh, practically give the same results um, in a gait model. Um, that is kind of interesting to know because inverse dynamics is almost infinitely more computationally efficient than the forward dynamic solution. So, uh, so this is a good argument for doing the inverse dynamics. Um, I also want to just direct your attention, if you want to know more about this whole field, to uh, the next week, um, actually the, at, the, at the end of next week, there will be a, um, a conference uh, in Cape Town. The uh, International Society of Biomechanics will have its World Congress in, in uh, Cape Town in South Africa. And uh, prior to that Congress will be a satellite symposium. Uh, about computer simulation, and I'm going to talk more about muscle recruitment at that symposium, and I will go a little more into some of the some of the finer details of the, of the recruitment algorithms in in that presentation. So if any of you are going there, I'm hoping to see you. Um, that was the theory behind it. Now I want to talk a little bit about how we implemented this into the anybody modeling system, and there are basically two aims that we try to meet um, by this implementation. The first one is that we want to provide the maximum freedom of definition of the muscle recruitment criterion to the user. And this is basically a never-ending test. We keep, in, we keep enhancing the system all the time. And we keep implementing newer and better algorithms in the system all the time. And as time passes, we get more and more algorithms and more and more choices for the user. Um, however, there are also some constraints. We, we have not made this completely user-defined, because if we did that, we would have to compromise some of the computational efficiency, and we don't want to do that. We want uh, to enable the user to uh, run models, complicated models like the one that you see here on the left-hand side, uh, in, um, in just a few seconds on an ordinary personal computer. And this is what, it, what, what is possible uh, when we retain the numerical efficiency of the muscle recruitment algorithms. So we're trying to strike a balance between those two considerations, basically. Now, anybody... Uh, models are programmed in a programming language. The programming language is called Inuscript. And so inside the Inuscript model, you can find a section called the study section. And that's the one that you see highlighted here at the top of the screen. The anybody study is basically a specification of things that you can do to your model. So you can imagine that you have one section, which is by far the biggest one of the, of the, of the whole model, which is the description of muscles and bones and joints and so on. And then you have another sort of separate section, which is the study, that contains various operations that you can do to the model. The basic version of the study is very, very simple, and it simply looks like what you see here. There's just three statements in this, uh, in this study that you see here. And that's actually all that you have to define in order to uh, do, an, do a, a basic set of analysis uh, with the anybody modeling system. 
However, you can also add a lot of stuff to this study in order to, con to uh, control what the study is doing. And so we're going to look a little bit into that uh, in, on, on the next slide. Um, I want to first talk about what kind of muscle recruitment uh, criteria of polynomial form is, uh, are implemented in the system. Um, the first one is that we, uh, even though I said that the linear criterion is not a good criterion, we did in fact implement the linear criterion. And the reason why we did that was for completeness and also because it is useful for some identification purposes. It's not actually useful for identifying what the muscle forces in the system actually are because it's not going to give you the right results. But it's very useful for identifying which muscles are the most important um, about each degree of freedom uh, when you have a certain work task that you ask the model to do. And, uh, and that obviously has some implications in orthopedics and, and uh, ergonomics and other types of uh, issues that you might want to deal with. Then we have a quadratic, a dedicated quadratic algorithm, and that's the one that you see here. This is the objective function in the, the dedicated quadratic algorithm. You see we have a quadratic term, the, one, the first one that you see here, and then we have a linear term which, is, uh, which can be added to it. And this is actually not quite consistent with the form that I showed you earlier, where we only had one degree, uh, uh, one type of, of, uh, of, of terms av available in the objective function. So either all the terms were first order or second order or, order or third order and so on. So here we actually have both the second and the first order. The reason why we have that is that uh, there are some um, papers coming out in the literature. You can look up uh, papers by Trachman, um in, uh, in the Journal of Biomechanics, and uh, you will find some very interesting experimental studies uh, that, um, that are ingenious and actually are designed to reveal uh, what the correct muscle recruitment criterion is. And, uh, and the thing that they come up with is that the correct criterion is a composite criterion consisting of a second order and a first order uh, term. And so if you want to do that kind of thing, you can do that with this uh, kind of criterion that we have here. There's also a general uh, p-norm type of criterion that you see down here. Now, the p-norm criterion is exactly equivalent to, um, to, to that uh, uh, a form that I showed you initially uh, for our objective functions. And you can see that in this case we can, we can set p to be any value between 1 and 5. Um, of course, if you set p equal to 1, then you basically get the linear term that we have up here. So that would be the same as that. And if you set p equal to 5, uh, you will get something that is fairly nonlinear. And then we have all, all the, the different combinations in between. In fact, p doesn't even have to be an integer. p can be a real number. So you can, you can um, scale p um, uh, completely uh, uh, um, with, a, with a small step that you want between these um, values. The reason why we cannot have p larger than 5 is that if p becomes too big, uh, we can get into situations where uh, the, we get numerical problems in, uh, in the system and it gets difficult to solve. And we basically wanted to have um, cases always where we would be sure that the, the user always gets a solution back from the system. So we, we constrained ourselves to only um, p values smaller than 6. Now, I'm going to do a little demo uh, that explains the difference between these polynomial forms. So I'm going to close down my presentation. I'm just going to press escape a couple of times. And then I'm going to open up the anybody modeling system. And this is the anybody modeling system. And I'm going to open up a model. And I'm going to take a standard model, uh, which is from the, the standard model repository. So this comes with, uh, from, from the, the, the open source model repository that we have. And um, if I open up a model view, you, you'll see that this is a two-dimensional model of a bicycle. Now, uh, let's try to analyze this model. And uh, I'm going, going into my, I'm just going to go into my, into my study here, and you can see that I have, at the bottom of the model, I have the anybody study uh, folder that contains those standard parameters that I talked about before. Now, if I use the standard parameters, I'm go what I'm going to get is I'm going to get, I'm going to get this, cri this criterion here. I'm going to get a p norm with p equal to 3. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, why we have chosen that as the standard. So uh, we're going to load this in. Oh, I did that already. 
Then I'm going to select over here at the study section, I'm going to se select the inverse dynamics, and then I'm going to run the model. And you may not see all the steps on your computers out there because there's a limitation to the transmission speed in the WebEx system. Um, but hopefully you saw some of the steps of the bicycle going around here. And then I'm going to open a new window. And in this new window, I can study the results of the analysis. So I'm going into the human folder. I'm going to find the right leg. And I'm going to find the muscles. And inside, inside the muscles, I'm going to find, for instance, the left eye. And I'm going to take the muscle activation. So this is the activity in the muscle. Uh, this is the percentage of muscle activation. Um, uh, the percentage uh, of uh, maximum voluntary contraction that the muscle is activated. OK, so I'm going to show all, all the muscles at the same time. I can do that by adding an asterisk up here in my specification line. And I get this picture here. And uh, you can see now that uh, we get various muscle activations. And I'm not going to go into all of them. If, we, if I hold my mouse over, you can see which muscle. Uh, the curve is uh, designating. But I want to concentrate on the maximum activation, which you see here. And if I add horizontal lines, you can see that this is roughly 16 and a half percent in this case. Let's just save this result. I'm just going to copy that to my clipboard. And then I'm going to open up a little placeholder where I can place the result like this. So now we're saving the result here for later use. Make this as small as possible. OK, so we can bring that up later. Now, now if I want to spe uh, specify a different criterion, I'll go back to my, my study. And I'll go in here. And I will open up my model. The model has a study section over here in my tree on the left-hand side. This is pretty much the same idea that you probably know from CAT, from CAT systems or finite element systems. The whole model is represented in a tree. And uh, I, will, I can find here my study section. The study section has a, uh, a section that is about inverse dynamics. And if I open that up, I can find inside the inverse dynamics a section about the criterion. The criterion I can also open up. And the criterion, in this case, has a type. If I double click that, I can see what it is. So you see the type now is MR polynomial. It means that it's a standard polynomial. And if I click the power, you can see that the power is set to 3. So right now, the polynomial is actually a, um, a recruitment function, um, a polynomial recruitment function with power 3. Um, so I'm going to change that. I'm going to set the power to 2 instead, so we get a quadratic polynomial. And I can uh, insert the object name here. And then I can set this equal to 2. And so now I get a quadratic solution instead. And if I load the model again, and I run the model again. It doesn't look very much different from what you saw before. But I can go over to my chart view. I can take the activity again. And I can plot all of the muscles again. And now I can bring up the picture that I had before. So now you see the picture that I had before, right here. And uh, you can see that right now with the quadratic polynomial, which is one degree smaller than what we had before. We have a maximum muscle activation of roughly 19.5%. And before, we had a maximum activation of roughly 16.5%. So it went up a little bit. And the reason why it went up a little bit with this new criterion is that we went down one degree in the polynomial. And that means that we get a little bit less muscle synergism. So the smaller muscles are helping the big, bigger muscles a little bit less in the quadratic criterion than they do in the uh, cubic criterion. I can also do the opposite thing. I can also set the power to 5 or another value, but let's just try 5. And I load the model again. And I run the model again. And I go back to my chart of X. And I plot my activity again. like this. And I bring up the old third order polynomial as the reference again. And you see that now I have the maximum activation of roughly 14.5%. So now it is smaller than it was before. So you can see that the higher the degree of the polynomial I use, the less maximum activation I get. And the reason why I get less, less maximum activation is that the muscles are, are using more and more synergism the higher the order of the polynomial I'm using. 
So I'll get back again to anybody in just a second. I just want to introduce another concept to you first. So I want to talk a little bit about min-max forms. Because what happens actually if we let p go to infinity? Of course, I couldn't do that with a polynomial criterion in anybody, because that had an upper limit of, of p of 5. So I couldn't let p go to infinity. But mathematically, if I think about p going to infinity, what happens is that my original criterion, which is the one that I have here, which is the original criterion, the sum of um, muscle stresses, whatever we call it, in the power of p, when p goes to infinity, the minimization of that will approach the minimum of the maximum muscle stress in the system. And this is an interesting criterion from a physiological point of view, because that can be interpreted as a minimum fatigue criterion. And, um, and it's not possible to solve it in its pure form like this, but fortunately, there is a mathematical way of reformulating the criterion so that it becomes very easy to solve. And this gives us uh, a new criterion that we use in anybody, which we call the pure min-max, or min-max strict, which is the anybody word for that kind of criterion. And the way we reformulate it is that we introduce a new artificial variable that we call beta. Beta doesn't actually do anything in the system. It's just a, 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 a more or less random variable, but we try to minimize beta. And while we're minimizing beta, we introduce some additional constraints that say that all the muscle stresses must, must be smaller than beta. So the only way that beta can be smaller is by simultaneously reducing all of the muscle stresses. Um, and this is effectively the same as minimizing the maximum um, muscle stress in the system. And you see down here we have the original equilibrium equations and non-negativity constraints on the muscle forces. This is very simple to do, uh, because this actually is a linear problem. So it, um, it, it's a very nice problem to deal with from a mathematical point of view. And up until um, version 4 of the anybody modeling system, this actually used to be the standard criterion in anybody. Let's take a look at how that works when we define it in anybody. So I close down the presentation again, and then I go back to anybody, and I go back to my study. And now I have to make a new specification, because I have to specify a different type of criterion. So I'm going to insert the type specification here. And then I'm going to set this equal to another specification. If I can't remember what the name of the specification is, then I can go to the global part of my, of my tree over here, and I can find my muscle recruitment text down here, and I can find here the min-max strict specification, and I insert that, and I do like this, and now the power doesn't mean anything anymore, so we can reduce that or take it out, and then I can load this model, and I can run it again, and you see bicycles just like this before, and then I can plot my muscle activations, also just like I did before. And then I'm getting this result. And let's bring up the reference um, model of p equals to 3 that we had before, the polynomial or cubic uh, criterion that we used as a reference. Now, what are the difference between this, differences between these? Well, one difference is that when we use a min-max criterion, you can see that the maximally activated muscle is now only 12 and a half percent, and it was 16 and a half here, and it was I think with power five it was 14 and a half, but now we're actually down to 12 and a half, and 12 and a half is the lowest that you can get at all because mathematically you can prove that the min-max fixed criterion is the one that gives you the maximum muscle synergism, and you cannot get lower than that, um, and that's kind of nice because. It makes sense from a physiological point of view that the organism wants to postpone fatigue as far as possible. When you're bicycling, this definitely makes sense. However, there's also some things here that we don't like so well, and that is that the muscles tend to switch in and out very, very rapidly. So you see here's a muscle that switches out almost momentaneously, uh, and also here's a muscle that switches in uh, also instantly. And, um, and this is something that the muscles cannot really do. If you have a very slow mo movement, then maybe it doesn't matter so much because the real, uh, the real um, um, muscle recruitment might just be a sort of a smooth approximation of this. 
But if you have a very fast movement, then it, it doesn't really make sense that the nodules are switching in and out so quickly, uh, because they are not able to do that physiologically. Um, so we kind of like this criterion because it, it is minimum fatigue, it makes sense, but also we don't really like it because it, kind of, it, it tends to be too hard. It tends to switch the muscles on and off too quickly and, uh, and in a non-physiological way. So what can we do about that? Let's go back to the presentation and see whether we can get any good ideas. Well, the first thing, first idea that you might get is that we have polynomial criteria which would give us nice and smooth muscle transitions. And then we we have the min-match criterion, which would give us very rapid um, transitions. And so if we combine those two criteria, then perhaps we could get a combination of the, of, of the good features that those two criteria have. And the combination is the one that you see here. We still have our beta variable. Let me get my pointer again. We still have our beta variable here. And uh, But now we've added a linear term and a quadratic term. And I'm only going to focus on the quadratic term because that's actually the one that gives us uh, the nice features. If we add a quadratic term with some value of the factor here in front of it, uh, the epsilon 2, then we can control the smoothness of the min-max criterion. And I'm going to show you what the effect is of that in the anybody modeling system. So we're going to close this down again. And then we'll go back to anybody. And I'm now going to save this picture. So I'm saving this, and I'm putting it over here in my placeholder, like that. So now we've saved the the, uh, the stick min max, and then I'm going to change this to a new type of recruitment criterion, which we call min max aux, and the aux means auxiliary. So it means that we have an auxiliary term added to the min max criterion. And if we go back to the model, we can see what we need to add. So we need to add the auxiliary quadratic term. And so I'm going to add a weight to that term that is different from zero. And I'm going to select the number of one. So we are simply going to add the weight of one, which is usually a good choice, actually. It gives us a nice blend between the min-max criterion and um, and the polynomial, the polynomial term that we are adding to it now. Let's try to load that. It's done now. And let's try to run it. That's what we're doing now. Again, it looks pretty much the same. But if we go over and have a look at what the muscle recruitment pattern looks like, you will see something very attractive. You see something like this. So you see that the, muscle, the maximum muscle activation is still fairly low. Now this is just below 13% and before it was 12 and a half, and that's pretty good. Um, so we still have a lot of muscle synergism, and you can see that the muscles are really have a clear envelope and help each other a lot in this case. You can also see that we got rid of all the, 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 the rapid muscle transitions. They actually don't switch in quickly uh, and switch out quickly anymore. They switch in nice and smooth now, and, uh, and this is entirely feasible from a physiological point of view. So this actually looks like a pretty good idea. Um, and we were rather happy when we saw this in the beginning. Unfortunately, this um, criterion has a couple of drawbacks. Um, well, at least one significant drawback. And the significant drawback that it has is that it, um, it's, sorry, that was the wrong one. Here, it does not make it does not uh, take care of independent subsystems. This is the one that I wanted to show you. Um, and to give you an idea of what I mean by that, you can imagine that I do one model, which is a, a, a person lifting a box, say weighing 10 kilograms, and I get some muscle recruitment pattern out of that. Then I change the mass of the box, and I run to 5 kilograms instead, and I run the model once again, and I get obviously a different recruitment pattern. And probably it looks like the first one, except that the muscle recruitment is only half of what it was in the first place. Um, that kind of seems to make sense, and that's also what we would get with this criterion. However, if we put those models, those two models into the same model, and we run the two people inside the same model, even though they are not connected with each other at all, they can stand as far away from each other as we want. Um, one is lifting a 10 kilogram box, one is lifting a 5 kilogram box, then we will likely 
get the guy with a 10 kilogram box will likely get a similar muscle recruitment pattern from what to what we had before, because his recruitment is going to be determined mostly by the beta term here. But the guy with the with, with the with the light box, the guy with the 5 kilogram box, it turns out that his recruitment pattern will end up being determined by this criterion mostly, and um, and that means that. He will have a different muscle recruitment criterion if he is located in the same model as the guy with 10, 10 kilogram box from what he would have if he was in the model alone. And that doesn't really make sense. That seems physiologically wrong. And this is not something that you can find much information about in the literature, but it's something that you have to look out for when you're working with muscle recruitment. And that is the reason why we are still not completely ecstatic about the min-max auxiliary kind of uh, criterion, and we keep looking for better criteria. And that is also the reason why this criterion is not the standard criterion in anybody, but the polynomial, the third order polynomial criteria is the standard. Um, I've actually come most of the way through. Um, the first point I want to make in the conclusions is that I want to stress that the kind of inverse dynamics that we are doing in anybody is not static optimization, although you can find people who would call it static optimization. It is a misleading term. What we do is very much dynamic. We take all the dynamic terms into account, uh, except the activation dynamics of the muscles. Um, anybody offers you a lot of freedom for defining your own criteria, and if, and if you don't want to do that, it also offers you a standard criterion, which is a third order criterion, and that will give you very good results in almost every case that you can try out. Um, from a scientific point of view, there isn't really a clear answer on which criterion is the best one, but the good news is that the resulting recruitment patterns are actually quite similar uh, when you choose the reasonable criteria. And by reasonable criteria, I mean uh, the criteria that have a power larger than one. Um, we are going to continue our research um, into this field. And uh, the research is, is research that must do experiments and uh, corresponding models, and then we must compare the results of the experiments and the models. And we have been lucky enough to secure funding for a PhD student uh, who will begin working on this uh, from August, the 1st of August, and three years forward. And when we get three years down the line, hopefully he has some very interesting results to offer on which criterion is actually the right one. If you want to know more about this, we have some online resources. We have the Anybody Modeling System. Uh, you can get free demo licenses for the system. So if you want to try out your own work with these um, recruitment criteria, you can go there and you can download the system and you can get a free 30-day license for the system. If you want to use it beyond that, you have to buy a license from Anybody Technology. You can also go to the homepage of the Anybody Research Project. This is anybody.aau.dk at Obo University in Denmark. And you can find a lot of uh, more scientific type of information on that research project homepage. And finally, we recently have re re released a community homepage, which is called inspit.org. And this is a homepage that is managing the open source development of um, our body models. And this is an extremely important work that we're trying to get a lot of scientists and other people all over the world engaged in. Uh, it provides the open source library of body models and applications. It provides you a list of publications about validation and other things. It provides space for collaborative modeling projects. So if you want to do um, any sort of modeling projects together with other people, say you want to create a foot or a hand or whatever you might want to do, um, then you can actually set up your own space there, and you can work together with people on that space. It also has a section that will provide support when you run into problems, and it has a, a wiki section that allows you to type in or upload your own documents and other information about what you're doing. So I very much recommend that you take a look at that. Um, with that, I would like to say thank you very much for your for attending the webcast. We are going to take a brief very brief research while we review the questions that might have been asked but not answered yet, and then I'll come back and I will answer those questions right here. Please bear with us for a few seconds.